Thank you, Major. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Kids, as we go through this story, I want you to see if you can find out why did Nate give us sand? What, what possible connection could have been going through my brain when we got there? But as I have forgot my iPad, as I have been preparing for this morning, I've gotten so excited for this story and, and for what we have been journeying through throughout this summer as we have been looking at, do I have control of this? No. Maybe? Try it again? No. Nope. That's okay. All right. So as, as we have been t- taking this summer to look at the gospel of John and really the hope and prayer of John as he writes this um, is that we would, not that verse. John, chap- John chapter 20 tells us why John wrote this book, that we would believe in Jesus and have life in his name. The hope and goal as we walk through and look at the stories of Jesus and how he lived on mission is to see that our lives are to be transformed by his story. And then his story compels us to live differently. It's why we have this book. It's why we have these specific stories. And the more that I have read this week, in the past couple of weeks actually, this story, I have been so excited. I don't, okay, it's, it's going a little bit crazy. That's okay. Um, Technology is a blessing. I like don't have a fingerprint. So we're going to restart some stuff. And we probably are going to pray in just a second. Because I really, this has been the most excited I've been to preach in such a long time that it's not surprising to me the enemy would be like, yeah, let's mess it up. Um, all right, there we go. Let's see if this works now. Am I back to control? We're going to, yeah, there we go. Let's pray. Jesus, you are on your throne, and this is not about me. This is not about my excitement for this story. God, it's not about my slides. God, it's not about anything I had planned. Lord, it's about you. And so, Father, I pray that I would get out of the way. Lord, that your word, God, that this story of how you changed a man and revealed yourself to be the God of the universe and the promised savior and rescuer that we desperately need. Lord, would that just resonate and ring true and be so clear. I praise you that you are the light of the world and that you give those who are blind sight of who we all once were. And so God, it's for your name, it's for your glory that we gather, we continue to worship. God, that we, we, we come and want to feast on this story this morning. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So this story is awesome. And this story might be perhaps just one of the most beautiful miracles in the gospel of John. But in order for us to understand why this is such an incredible story and what Major just read is so powerful, I think we need to do some work to understand the context of what just happened and the story that we're going to walk through. And and, and so we have to start understanding that we're in the midst of, in the book of John, as John is telling these different accounts of Jesus's life and ministry so that we would believe and have a new life. We are in what's called kind of festival season. It's holiday season in the Jewish calendar. There's the Feast of Tabernacles. There's Yom Kippur. There's Hanukkah approaching. And so it's kind of like our Halloween to Christmas, where it just feels like, man, every other week there's something else to celebrate. That's where we are in the life and ministry of Jesus. From John chapter 7 to chapter 10 is just this account of festival season. And a huge chunk of that is what's known as the Feast of Tabernacles. This was one of the highlights in the Jewish calendar. It was a time for all of God's people to gather to Jerusalem, to camp out 
and light fires and tell stories, remembering God's goodness, remembering God's provision and protection in the Exodus account when God walked his people out of Egypt and then for 40 years they were wandering in the wilderness but their shoes didn't wear out, their clothes didn't wear out. They were provided food and water miraculously. By day, God led them by cloud. By night, God led them by fire. And so they would gather and they would remember for eight days all that God had done. But simultaneously, they were anticipating the coming of the Messiah, that if God had led them and freed them and brought them into a new kingdom in the past, they knew he would do it again. And we're in the midst of this season. And actually, in John chapter 8, Jesus, on day 8 of the Feast of Tabernacles, after seven nights of the Jewish people coming together and lighting these beautiful candles and literally like fire dancing and worshiping and making much of the fact that God led them by fire every night of the Feast of Tabernacles uh, culminated with beautiful fires and lots of light and celebration with the exception of day eight. Day eight would close with the Messiah didn't come and it's the end of the feast and we've got to wait a whole nother year. And they're preparing to go back to life as normal. And so on day eight of the Feast of Tabernacles, they would not have lit fires. They would have worshiped a little more somberly and in darkness because the feast had drawn to a close. And it's on this night in John chapter eight at that worship service where we see Jesus stand up after a week of remembering God's leadership by fire and anticipating he will do it again, that our king stands up and says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but he will have the light of life. Can you imagine for just a moment what this scene must have been like for out of the darkness calls our king, I'm the light, the one you've been waiting for, the one we've been celebrating all week. It's me. This creates a discussion between Jesus and the religious leaders that ultimately at the end of chapter eight, because the religious leaders who are supposed to be able to identify and have been preparing people for the coming of the Messiah, they are spiritually blind and they can't see Jesus for who he is. They pick up stones to throw at him. They want to murder him in the, at the end of a, a worship gathering. Like, don't, don't miss out on, like, like, that's like at the end of church today, you decide to pick up chairs and beat me to death. That's what's happening here. But Jesus isn't going, he's not gonna have his life stripped from him. He lays his life down. So we're told that he hides himself and leaves the temple. And just to be clear, Jesus and I are not on the same level. Like, that's, I'm not trying to make that point. But the religious leaders are blind to who Jesus is. And they're so offended that he would claim to be God that they want to murder him. And somewhere between there and the end of John chapter 10, our account here happens. Now, many, some commentators think, oh, it's right away that as Jesus is leaving the temple, it kind of reads like that. Others think time has passed because clearly the heat is a little bit off of Jesus with the story that Major just read that we're gonna walk through. The timeline to me is a little less important. What matters to me is that somewhere after Jesus calling out that I am the light of the world and teaching people about who he is, he reveals and demonstrates his power in this story. And so this is where we pick up. This is the story we're gonna walk through this morning. We're told that after that event and after people want to take his life, he passed by and he sees a man blind from birth. Now, two things really quickly that I want us to notice here. One, Jesus sees the suffering of this man. He notices this man that many people probably pass by, that many people probably just breeze right on by. Jesus notices him even in his suffering. He is seen by God. Maybe you need to hear this morning that God sees you. He sees your hurt. He sees your pain. He sees 
your suffering. But the other part that if you're familiar with this story or even as we've already looked at it, maybe you, you, you glance over the fact that he is blind from birth. If you highlight, if you underline, if you circle, that whole phrase is worth highlighting. The fact that he is blind from birth is what really makes this story so significant and powerful. And we, we need to understand what's happening in Jesus' day and age that makes this so significant. So they are anticipating the coming of the Messiah. And as years have passed, and God's people have gathered and anticipated the Messiah, and he hasn't come, the rabbis and the priests had begun to teach out of the Old Testament that when the Messiah shows up, there's gonna be three things specifically that he is going to do that nobody else can do. There are these three very specific Messiah-only miracles. The three miracles that only God could do is to heal a leper. Now, this is fascinating because in the Old Testament law, in Leviticus, we are given instruction for how God's people were to return to worship and cleanse themselves after being healed. But for centuries, they'd never been able to practice that because no person from the conclusion of the law, no Jewish man or woman, there's no record of anyone being healed of leprosy. And, yet, and so the priests would teach, the rabbis would teach, when the Messiah shows up, he will be able to heal a leper because we can't do it. They would also teach that when the Messiah showed up, he would be able to cast a demon out of somebody who has been muted, who couldn't talk from that demon. The, the rabbis and the priests had very specific processes for exercising a demon who could talk. You could call, if you could learn its name, you could cast it out, but you had to be able to name that demon and communicate with that demon. But if the demon kind of choked out the vocal cords so that person couldn't speak, they had no way of getting rid of it. And so the rabbis and the priests would teach that only God could get rid of a demon from a muted man, somebody who couldn't speak. And then lastly, someone who was born blind the priests and the rabbis had nothing for that person. They believed that either it's the sins of the father in Exodus 34, passing down from generation to generation, or this, this baby has given into its evil inclination even in the womb. And so therefore, they didn't attempt anything. That's God's judgment on that baby, that person. And so therefore, the only one who could do anything would be God himself, the Messiah who would come. And so the religious leaders would preach this is what we look for. And what's so incredible about this story, by the time we hit John chapter nine, more than likely Jesus has done two of the three. And so when he looks and sees this blind man from birth, I just get this picture in my head. This is just my imagination as I read the Bible of Jesus is like salivating. He's like, it's go time. I'm going three for three. And I'm not gonna miss this moment. And he is going to do what only God can do. But beforehand, we get this conversation, this question from the disciples. A very common question. Whose sin, whose fault is this? Is it the parents or is it the man? And again, this is a, a topic of the day, of Jesus's day that would have been widely debated. Is this the sins of the father passing down from the third and fourth generation, as we're told in Exodus 34? Or is it that, that somehow the man sinned in the womb of its mother and gave himself over to his sin nature? There is this assumption that it's gotta be one or the other by the disciples. Some rabbis would even teach that when a baby kicked its mom in the womb, that was evil. That was its sin nature. Like that thing that we like celebrate and you freak out when you're white, like when you, dads, when you can finally feel the baby, you're like, that's amazing. Rabbis would go, no, that's sin nature right there. That's wickedness. Crazy, crazy. But that's the assumption. And that therefore they had given themselves over to this evil inclination and were born under God's judgment and wrath. That's why they were born blind. But our king, Jesus, sees a third option. He sees that this may be, and Jesus' answer to their question, whose fault is it? He says it's not the man or his parents, but, and again, if you highlight or underline, this is worth underlining. The works of God might be displayed. 
He says that we've, we've got work to do. We must work the works of him who sent while it's day, night is coming when no one can work. He says, I've got stuff, I'm on a mission, I've got stuff to do. The grave is coming, there's gonna be this dark moment, but in the meantime, I'm going three for three. I'm gonna fulfill all messianic miracles. And this man was born blind so that the work of God might be displayed. And then he reminds the disciples of who he is. I'm the light of the world. Now the purpose of this story is to reveal Jesus' power to restore blindness, to, to rescue those from blindness, especially as we get to the end, spiritual blindness, which is way worse than the physical blindness that this man is experiencing. But don't miss, this man was born blind. And just looking around the room this morning, there's hard things in this room. There's tough stories in here. And maybe you've wrestled with Man, is this a consequence of my sin? Is this somebody else's fault? Why is life so hard? Why do I suffer? Jesus here gives a third option that I think is a really important secondary lesson we can learn from Jesus. Not only does he come to restore sight and heal the blindness that we all are born into, but also maybe the suffering you are experienced is so that the work of God might be displayed. This man has suffered, I'm just gonna guess for decades. We know he's at least 13 years old. He's old enough to answer for himself, to give an account and tell his story. We'll see that in depth here in just a moment. But he has suffered from birth for this moment. And he says, Jesus says it's not his sin, it's not the man's sin. That yes, we've got a Genesis 3 problem going on here, but ultimately, it was for this moment. And so Jesus sees a different purpose, that it's so that the works of God might be displayed. And then we get the miracle. We're gonna start moving a little bit faster. Those of you looking at your watches, exhale, we'll get through it. The miracle here, he says, having said these things, he spits, he makes mud, he anoints the man's eyes with mud, and he tells him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And so just quickly here, here's what, kind of the scene that takes place. Jesus sees the man. He has a conversation with his disciples. The, the man who has just uh, not that long ago declared himself to be the living water, because maybe you're like, why mud? That's kind of gross. Why, why did he spit and take dirt? And Well, here's the two things I think that's happening. The living water mixes with the dust of the earth, which Genesis 1 and 2 tells us is where we all came from. And he mixes it and he puts it on the eyes of the man, I think symbolizing, I'm about to give you a new life in me. That the living water mixes with the dust of the earth to bring new life. But then also I think there's a very practical, this, this phrase, he anointed the man's eyes, is not just a little bit of mud. It was probably quite a bit. And he covers the man's eyes. A lot of commentators believe that this man was healed instantly. But he's still gotta go to the pool and get the mud off of his face. And so what happens in this moment though is even if the man is healed instantly, he can't gaze upon the face of Jesus which actually is going to protect him here in just a moment as he's interrogated. And he's then commanded by the Son of God and through the Word of God to do the will of God to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. This is not an easy journey. This is back down the mountain. This is steep and a little bit treacherous, though the man's probably familiar with it. It's also probably a really popular spot right now because this pool has significance around the festival season. And so Jesus sends him into a crowd of people. And the response of the man is to go and obey. He went and he washed. Notice, there's no promise of a miracle. There's no promise of healing. Really, there's no, that we're told, no conversation between Jesus and the man. This is almost like a forced miracle upon this dude. He didn't ask for it. Jesus just goes and covers it. Like, can you imagine all of a sudden, like somebody's putting mud on your face and telling you to go and wash, but he's hearing the one who created the heavens and the earth, command him. And his response is to obey and he is healed. Which is then going to cause quite a bit of confusion and quite a bit of questioning for those who are around. The first group we see are these neighbors, the people who would have known him, who are familiar with him. And we see that there's even a debate. This man is so transformed 
that some who knew him said, isn't this the guy who used to sit and beg and ask for money? Some said, yep, it's him. Others said, no, it can't be. He's just, he's just a doppelganger. He looks like him, but it can't be him. He can see. And that other guy was born blind. No one can do that. No one's been healed in this way. And the man has to testify to his own identity. And he says, yep, that's me. I used to be blind. He knows his past condition. But he goes on to then give a pretty detailed account in verse 11 and 12. Look at him share his story. He says, the man called Jesus, and then he lays out exactly what happened. And I love that as we walk through this man's story, he is comfortable with those last three words on verse 12. I don't know. He doesn't pretend to know more than he does. He doesn't hypothesize. He doesn't guess. He just shares his story, his encounter with Jesus. And so he tells him, he, he, Jesus put mud on my eyes. He anointed me. He told me to go and wash. I went and now I can see. And this is a declaration that God has done something impossible that has never been done before. And so the neighbors, the friends, the people who recognized him because it's festival season, because the religious leaders are easily accessible, they say, well, if God is doing the impossible, we got to loop in the pastors and the small group leaders. So they take him to the Pharisees. They take him, and I love that John says, the man who had formerly been blind. We're told it's the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. And so they ask the same question the neighbors do. How did this happen? The only way that this could happen was if the Messiah showed up. So tell us your story. And he gives a little bit of a, simpl a simplified version. I skipped too far. He says, well, he put mud on my eyes, I washed, and now I see. I can't help but wonder if this man knew his audience and that they didn't really want the in-depth version of the account. And so he tells them his story a little bit more simplified. They don't believe it. They, they question because they're spiritually blind. The Pharisees say, no, 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 this can't be because we know Jesus doesn't keep the Sabbath. Now, Jesus has already declared he is Lord over the Sabbath. And this creates division among the religious leaders. Some say it can't be because Jesus hasn't been obedient. If he's healing on the Sabbath, he's not listening, he's a sinner. And other Pharisees are going, wait, we have literally taught on the fact that only God could do this. A sinner can't. And so there's division among the Pharisees. And catch this, those who are responsible for pointing people to truth and helping people understand the Messiah and the Old Testament, the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders turn to the blind man and say, will you help us? What do you say? We can't agree on ourselves. Will you help us? What do you say about him? And the man, to the best of his ability, says he's a prophet. Now, I think this is a little bit more bold than it reads on the page. Because don't miss, again, from, from the Pharisees' point of view, it's been over 400 years since they've gotten a fresh word from the Lord, since they've gotten direction from him. They are eager and anticipating God doing something. And so this blind, formerly blind man stands up and to the best of his ability says, I think God has sent this man to declare truth and to bring us into a new place. That's what a prophet would do, would call people to a new way of life, to remind them of God's truth, to point them towards a better way of obedience. And so the man here is doing the best he can to share his story and his encounter with Jesus. But this doesn't jive. Because the religious leaders and the Jewish people are spiritually blind, they can't see Jesus for who he is. They don't believe that he'd been blind and had received sight. They can't. It doesn't fit their paradigm. And so now they gather mom and dad. And they say, mom, dad, come together. We need you to testify. Was your son really born blind? Because if he wasn't, we can justify it. Because now there's, there's an avenue that not just God could heal this man. And how did he receive his sight? How is it that he can see now? And the parents' response 
is basically, we know he's our son. He was born blind. If you've got other questions, you need to go talk to him. John tells us that they say, he's of age, ask him. We know it's a little bit because of fear that the religious leaders don't want people testifying that Jesus is the Messiah. And that if they do, they are excommunicated. They are kicked out of the family of God. But regardless of the why behind it, I love that the parents are like, let him tell his story. He can share his experience. All we know is he was born blind and now he can see. And so for the second time, they go back and interrogate him. And I love, I love the, the, the ridiculousness of the end of verse 24. They say, glorify God and call his son a sinner. That's what the, the religious leaders are asking this man to do. And he answers again with all that he knows. He says, one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. That's all I know. Whether he's a sinner or not, I know I couldn't see and that only God could do it. And now I can see. He doesn't pretend to know more than he does. He doesn't pretend to have it all together or have all the answers. He just shares what Jesus has done in his story. And so they ask him again, well, what did he do? How did this happen? Only God could do this. Give us a different answer. And now the man gets a little spicy, and I love it. Verse 27, he says, I've told you already. You wouldn't listen. Why do you want to hear it? Do you want to start following him? Are you going to become like one of his disciples? You keep asking, like, do we need to have an altar call for you Pharisees? Are you going to raise your hand and give your life to Jesus? Why do you keep asking? asking, and this sets them off. They are livid with this man. They say, no, 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 you're his disciple. We follow Moses because we know where Moses comes from. We know God spoke to Moses. We don't know this guy. We can't see him for who he is. We don't understand him. He doesn't fit in our, our box. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for Jesus, we don't know. Let me translate that, the Nate paraphrase. They are confessing their spiritual blindness towards the light of the world. They are acknowledging we can't see Jesus, so we choose a different path. They can't see him. And so the man then responds to this declaration by saying, an amazing thing has happened. And then the rest of this part of the man's story is basically him giving their teaching back to them. What they have stood up in the synagogues and in the temple and shared, when the Messiah shows up, this is one of the three things that he's going to do. He's saying, you don't know where he comes from, but, but he opened my eyes and you've told me only the Messiah could do that. God doesn't listen to sinners and a worshiper, uh, uh, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Verse 32, he says, never since the, the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. It's like, you guys have told me when the Messiah shows up, he will do something like this. This has never happened before. And if he wasn't from God, how, he couldn't do this. This is impossible. Remember, according to the religious leaders, this is one of the three things that only God could do. And the man is testifying and reminding them of their own beliefs. But again, they're spiritually blind. And so their response to this is to, to, to cast him out, to call him out. So you were born in sin and you think you're gonna teach us? No, get out of God's family. There were different levels of excommunication and being cast out. This is the most extreme. He is never again allowed in temple. This is devastating. When I think about the journey this man has been on and now his eyes are opened and he could come into the temple and he could worship and he could see and he could, he could celebrate. And the religious leaders say, get out, you can't see this. You're not welcome here. This is heartbreaking if this was where the story stopped. 
But as heartbreaking as it is that they cast him out, that just makes verse 35 all the more beautiful. Because Jesus hears that he's been rejected. And what does he do? He goes and finds him. And then he asks him this question, do you believe in the son of man? That's Jesus's way of saying, do you believe in the Messiah? The one who could, the only one who could do what has happened to you. Do you believe? And remember, Jesus's mo- his method of healing was to cover his eyes. This man has not seen Jesus face to face. And so his question, I believe, is really out of desperation. Who is he so that I can believe? I've experienced healing, but I know there's more in store. And I want to know the Messiah. And Jesus here says, you, you've seen him. You're looking at him. It's the one you're speaking to right now. This is a beautiful moment between this man and Jesus. And his response is to believe and have new life, to worship him. Now, not only has he experienced physical healing, but there's a spiritual awakening that has taken place as he has gazed upon the Messiah and believed. And that's the goal. That's the purpose is not just a physical healing, but Jesus here is demonstrating his power over all of life, including our spiritual life. And and he's going to say that for judgment, he's come into this world so that those who do not see may see. And those who see may become blind. He's basically acknowledging that he has come for those who recognize I'm stuck and I need God to do what only God can do. He says, I've got you. But for those like the religious leaders who say, no, 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 we're going to go a different path. We're going to choose Moses. We're going to choose our own abilities. We're going to choose nature. We're going to choose all sorts of other things. He says, "You're, you're blind, some Pharisees clearly are listening in and they go, are, are you talking about us? Are, are, are we blind? And Jesus basically goes, yep. Yep, I'm talking about you. If you were blind, you'd have no guilt. If you knew you needed a savior and God to do what only God could do, I could help you. But you know what? You say, we got this. We're, we'll, we'll figure it out. We've got a different path. Jesus, you don't fit our box. He says, your guilt remains. You're stuck. You're blind. You're spiritually blind. And I really believe the key moment in this man's story, in all of this, was when he testified. There's one thing I know. I was blind. Now I see God showed up and did what only God can do. My question for us this morning is do you have a I once was blind, but now I see moment. Where you would say, man, I was stuck. I was dead in my sin and my trespasses. I was blind and in darkness. But God, as we heard Nat read earlier, God is the only one who can bring sight to those who are spiritually blind. And don't miss this. We are all the blind man. We are born spiritually blind and we need God to do what only he can. And my question for you is, do you have that experience? Do you have that as a part of your story where you would say, I once was blind, but Jesus. If you don't, I want to pray and give space this morning for for you to have that experience. And that only comes by the spirit of God through the word of God. That's nothing I can do, no magic prayer that you can have. That takes God intervening in your story. But for those of us who would say, yes, I have that story. My question from the example of the life of this man is notice how over and over he shares just what God is doing in his life. How are you sharing your experience? Are you having experiences with Jesus that are worth sharing? Regardless of the consequences, he's kicked out and he's still willing to share. 
he's still willing to worship. He's still willing to declare, I once was blind, but now I see. Is your story one that has a, I once was blind, but now I see? And how are you sharing that? Let me pray for us, and then we're going to transition into a time of communion and prayer. Jesus, I thank you for this story. I thank you for your truth. God, for all those in this room that miraculously can say, I once was blind, but now I see. God, I thank you. I praise you for the gift of sight. Lord, if there is a man, woman, or child in here that does not have that as a part of their story, I would ask that today would be the day, Lord, that you would see them and wash over them by your Spirit.